Hello everyone and welcome to another video in the Endgame series. Now it has been several months since the last video came out and I know that everybody's been very, very patient, but at the start of the Endgame series I made the promise that this time I won't procrastinate and I won't abandon this project until I've assembled a, a serious database of Endgame videos. Well, it took me a while, I was tempted to procrastinate, I did, but now I'm back on track and these Endgame videos are you know, the toughest videos that I make because of the, the research that they require and the prep that they require, but I really, really enjoy making them and I'm glad that I'm continuing this project and I hope you are too. So uh, this is gonna be the fourth video in our pawn endgame section. We've talked so far about past pawns, uh, pawn races, and pawn breakthroughs. You can find those videos in uh, my endgame playlist. And the way that the Endgame series as a whole works is that you really should be watching the videos in order. So if you haven't seen one of those videos, you should go ahead and watch that uh, before attempting to watch this one. So you might be listening to those titles and say, oh, pawns, pawns, pawns. What about the king? It's not just pawn endgames, it's king and pawn endgames. And so today we will be taking on a very ambitious challenge indeed. We will be talking about how to properly use your king in king and pawn endgames. I'll be showing you all of the techniques that you have to know in order to optimize your king use and to make sure that you not only know how to operate your pawns and uh, you not only know techniques for breaking through and for properly racing your pawns, but you also know where and how to position your king even in complicated pawn endgames. So this is a very uh, ambitious task for one video. We have a lot to get through. This video might actually hit close to an hour. I don't know. Uh, so my recommendation, brew yourself, you know, your favorite cup of coffee, uh, clear your desk, turn your phone off, you know, prepare to really focus because this video is going to be packed with stuff. Uh, I hope it won't be overwhelming. I'll still try to go relatively slowly, but my recommendation is that you have a board nearby. You get ready to pause the video uh, because, you know, again, there's just going to be a lot of stuff, uh, both in terms of definitions and in terms of illustrations. So the structure of this video is going to be similar to the previous Endgame videos. We will start with definitions. I'll introduce you to nine themes, concepts, topics that you have to know uh, in order to uh, master king use in pawn endgames. And then we will have the second section where I put these concepts to, uh, to the test. And I show you actual real life examples where these concepts are successfully or as we'll see, unsuccessfully used by strong players to win and sometimes to lose pawn endgames. So without further ado, let us jump in. All right, so let's start with definitions and with king use especially because there are nine terms, it's really important that you pay attention to this section. I'll be using these terms so, so often. Uh, and so it's important to make sure that we're all on the same page, even if you've heard uh, these concepts and words a million times before, you know, just make sure that you're uh, that you're fully aware of all of the nuances behind each definition. That's going to make it so much more efficient, effective uh, for us to do the practical examples. Um, okay, so let's start with the total rudiments. The arguably the most important uh, concept related to king use, not just in pawn endgames, but in endgames as a whole, is opposition. Right, if you've played chess for more than two weeks, you have probably heard this term bandied about. Opposition is a simple concept. It is a situation uh, in which the kings are staring at each other and there is one square between them. That's literally all it is. Uh, this is just a typical example of opposition. And the kings are necessarily uh, staring at each other vertically. There's different types of oppositions. We'll get to that very shortly. Now, Okay, you're like, well, I get it. Why is opposition so frequently talked about? Why is it so important? Well, it's actually easy to understand why it's important. The reason it's important is, well, let's say that white is the one who just stepped into the opposition. Let's say that white's king moved from f3 to e4. Okay, the kings are in opposition. What does that mean? Well, it's black to play. And the thing is, black, let's assume black has no pawn moves. Black has to move their king. Okay, why is that important? Well, in pawn end games, you're normally trying to go toward your opponent's side of the board. And you should already start to understand why opposition is such a powerful tool. Because whichever way the black king moves, if it moves to the right, then it opens up a pathway to the left. And vice versa, if the black king moves to the left, then white's king is able to infiltrate 
uh, on the right side of the board. Finally, if the king moves down, uh, then you're giving white uh, a choice of all three directions. So opposition is a very powerful tool that allows you uh, to maximize your king activity and, and put your opponent in a situation where, uh, where they have to yield a pathway for your king. So this is direct opposition. Now, there's different forms of opposition. Uh, by far, the most common type of opposition is direct opposition, the one you see in front of you. But you should be familiar with the other types. Uh, in particular, there is uh, distant opposition or long distance opposition. Uh, that is vertical opposition where there are three or five squares between the kings. Uh, it's literally the same thing as regular opposition, except there's uh, more space between the two kings. And this is important because assuming that, you know, let's say it's black to move, black will probably have to move his king up at some point. And if he does, then of course, white can step into regular opposition. So long distance opposition is, uh, you know, a often a means to an end. And we'll see uh, a great application of uh, long distance opposition in the, in the practical section. Then there is diagonal opposition. It's just like regular opposition, except the kings are staring at each other diagonally with one square uh, between them. Diagonal opposition is a lot less important in the grand scheme of things than regular opposition. And much like distant opposition, it's often a means to achieve regular opposition. So for example, let's say that white's king has stepped onto c3. The kings are in diagonal opposition. So oftentimes the point of doing that is to lure black into playing king d5, and now white steps into regular opposition with king d3. Okay, so you should be mostly familiar with regular opposition. You should know that there's these different forms of opposition that are found in the wild. Okay, uh, then we have, uh, well, actually we have a fourth, uh, fourth example of opposition, uh, which is less commonly seen in books. I don't think this term really exists. I call it pawn-assisted opposition. So pawn-assisted opposition is a situation where the kings themselves are in opposition, but the square between them is occupied by a pawn. And you could think of this as opposition on steroids, uh, because not only is black's king pushed away, it's actually pushed backward, right? In regular opposition, the king can go to the side. Here, the king actually has to step back, allowing white's king to step forward. And what you'll often see, and we'll look at an example that has this very directly, you can basically keep repeating pawn-assisted opposition uh, to keep pushing the enemy king backward. You can go e5 and king e4. Now, if there are no other pawns on the board, then as you might know, this is actually a theoretical draw. White is unable to win this game. But remember, when we're talking about definitions, uh, you shouldn't take this literally. You should assume that there are other pawns on the board. I'm just trying to show the concept itself. So pawn-assisted opposition, super powerful tool, and, uh, and, and pretty common as well. So those are the four different types of opposition. Now, opposition in and of itself is totally meaningless if you don't also understand what Zugzwang is. And Zugzwang, of course, a German word uh, that I'm pretty sure comes from Zug, which is move, and Zwang, I think, means trouble. So literally, it means move trouble. And Zugzwang is a situation uh, in which any move leads to uh, harm of your position, any move leads to a disadvantage. Now, in the context of the end game, when I say that, let's say, black is in Zugzwang, what I mean most of the time is that any move that black can make loses the game. It allows the opponent to make progress in some way uh, that loses the game. And another way that you can think of Zugzwang is a situation in which you would rather pass and give the turn back to your opponent, allow your opponent to make two moves in a row, rather than making a move on your own. Now, in the middle game, Zugzwang is almost non-existent. There's a lot of pieces on the board, so normally you'd benefit from making two moves in a row. There are examples of middle game Zugzwang that are really fascinating, maybe a topic for a later video. But in the end game, because your moves are limited, uh, and because it's all about infiltrating with the king, Zugzwang is uh, ridiculously common. Almost every decisive pawn in game is in some way decided by Zugzwang. And in front of you is a very simple example of it. So here, white can make the move king e4, incidentally stepping into opposition. And you can see the correlation between opposition and Zugzwang. King e4 puts black in Zugzwang. And the reason why is that whichever direction the king steps onto, 
as we discussed, the white king will step in the opposite direction. And in both cases, black is going to lose one of his pawns, either the C pawn or the H pawn. So if king F6, then king D5, and black will lose the pawn race. And if black goes the other direction, then white goes to the right and picks up the H pawn, winning the game. So I will refer to Zugzwang in literally every example. You know, it's incredibly important that you understand that you frequently take opposition in order to cause Zugzwang. That's the way that these two concepts are related. Okay, so that's Zugzwang. On we go to shouldering, another very ubiquitous pawn endgame concept that you might have heard of. And shouldering is a process where you use your king uh, almost literally with your shoulder to push the opponent's king away uh, in an undesirable direction of the board. Uh, so the, the easiest way to illustrate this is with an example. It's actually hard to provide a verbal definition. So in front of you is a very well-known theoretical position. Believe it or not, white is able to win this position. You might think, well, even if black gives away the pawn, it's still a draw. It's actually not a draw. So what does white do in the initial position? As a matter of fact, white can make a bunch of different moves. The most clinical is to grab diagonal opposition, although that doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter that it's opposition. You can actually also play king d5. The point is that after black makes a king move, black plays king f7. Of course, black does not want to yield any ground and allow white's king to go to f6. Now you start the shouldering process. You go king d6. Notice how you're that's the reason it's called shouldering. You're doing it sort of from the side with your shoulder. Uh, Black's king has to move away, and it has to yield a square on the e-file. Okay, then black will try to go king g7. We go up to e7. Same situation. Black is in Zugzwang, has to yield a square on the f-file. On we go, on we go, until this situation is reached. The king has to step back, actually giving away the pawn. And it's worth noting that even though black grabs opposition here, uh, this is a winning position for white because the pawn has reached the fifth rank. So here the king steps away, king h8, g6, king g8, g7, and this is a very famous position. Black has to go king f7, and white wins the game with king h7. So another thing that you should notice here is that just because a side has opposition, right, normally when a side steps into the opposition, it stand, that side stands to benefit, but that's not always the case, right? You shouldn't just blindly grab opposition. There's plenty of examples where the side that steps into opposition doesn't really gain anything at all. Uh, so, you know, everything should be contextualized within the actual position. But this is shouldering, very important process that allows you to win a lot of games. All right, next we have the waiting move or waiting moves. Now, waiting moves, as the uh, name suggests, are pawn moves uh, with the express intent of putting the opponent in Zugzwang. So it's a pawn move that does nothing except uh, essentially wait, waits your opponent out and, and puts your opponent in Zugzwang. And frequently in pawn end games, both sides will have a a store of waiting moves. Like for example, white could have three waiting moves, black could have two waiting moves. And we'll talk about this more in the practical segment, but very often you, when you look at a position, you want to identify the amount of waiting moves that each side has. So here's a very simple example. So it's white to move in this position. As you can already probably guess, even without calculating the best move, is king e4 stepping into opposition. Now, you'll notice that this is a very similar position to our illustration of Zugzwang itself. Pawns are in the same place. So the only difference is that I have added a pair of A pawns. Okay, how does that impact the position? Well, let's think about this. What does white want to achieve? Well, white wants to achieve this situation with black to move. White wants to make black push his king. But black's not going to push their king. Black has waiting moves with the A pawn. Black wants to do the same thing that white wants to do. Black wants for white to be in Zugzang, for white to have to move his king. Because if white has to move their king, then the kings just dance around. King f4, king f6, and black is able to achieve a draw. So now we get this very common waiting game where both sides start exhausting and tapping into their store of waiting moves. And the side that runs out of waiting moves last uh, induces Zugzwang. Slack is best advised to play a6. a5 exhausts two waiting moves at once, and is a very bad idea. White will meet that move with a4, and black is once again in Zugzwang. So after a6, pause the video and make sure that you understand how white should respond. Because a very, very common mistake is for a player to just sort of absentmindedly push the pawn two squares, a4. 
Well, that's very bad because after a5, it's now white who is in Zugzwang. Here, I'm not using Zugzwang to say that white is losing. I'm using Zugzwang to say that white has lost the ability to win the game. The game actually ends in a draw because neither side can make any progress. So instead, white only exhausts one of the waiting moves, forces black to use his last one, and locks black into Zugzwang with a4. So all of the moves with the A pawns have been waiting moves with the aim of putting black in Zugzwang, which white has succeeded in doing, as you can see in this position. Okay, so then we have a concept that I will not be talking about too extensively in this video. Uh, we will be broaching it in more depth in uh, subsequent videos where we actually talk about really advanced position, positions, and it's the concept of triangulation. So triangulation is, much like waiting moves, is a method whose aim is to put the opponent in Zugzwang. And, and this, you will notice, is a, a theme of pawn endgames as a whole. You do all this stuff, and the ultimate, the end goal, is often to force your opponent's king to move away from a certain square and give you access uh, to a decisive square. So you can think of triangulation as a method that achieves a certain position with the other side to move. So take a look at this very well-known position, which has occurred actually in a bunch of different games. Okay, so it's white to play. And, you know, you should be disappointed to hear me say that. Why? Because if it was black to move, then black would have to step away with his king, and white would infiltrate b6, win the a6 pawn, and win the game easily. So the moment you hear yourself say that, wait a second, if I had this same position with the other side to move, then I would be winning. That is a clear sign that you should think about whether you have any waiting moves, and if you don't have any waiting moves, triangulation often comes to the rescue. So when you triangulate, you make an odd number of moves with your king in order to create a situation where your opponent has no choice but to reach the same position with the other side to move. So white starts by playing king d5. That's literally the only move. Black's king has to step away. And you're like, man, I wish I could play king d5 to b6. Now, you might look at it and say, wait a second, well, I can go to d6 and this is winning, but... It's actually not, because if you play c7, after king c6, black is in stalemate. So the only winning method is to get your king to b6. So now we start the triangulation. We drop the king back to c4. Now, again, remember, the moment black steps to c7, you move the king up to c5. The goal has been achieved. So black's not going to do that. c7 is known as a mind square. That's, I think, a term Mark Dvoretsky uh, coined in his endgame manual. A mind square is just a square that you can't step onto because it will lead to Zugzwang. So white has a corresponding mind square on c5. White doesn't, white doesn't want to step onto c5 because then we're back where we started, black plays king c7. And here's the crux of triangulation. You go around, you go king d4. Okay, again, king c7, king c5, black has to keep waiting. And now we move the king up to d5. And this is the rub. Because black has to choose between going king c7 and allowing the same position with black to move, or playing king d8. And now we get this position. Previously, we also had this with white to move, and that would be a draw. Now it's black to move. Black has to play king c8, c7, king b7, and king d7. Now the funny thing is after king a7, don't make a queen. That stalemate, the fastest win, is just to make a waiting move with your king. Um, so... You might be like, wait, I'm confused. Like, how did all this happen? So let's trace the actual path of the king. Notice that the white king goes from d5 to c4 to d4, back to d5, in the shape of a triangle. And the reason I won't delve too deeply into why triangulation actually, like, works mathematically, we'll save that for future videos. Just sort of keep this uh, abstractly in the back of your mind. And I think the practical example that I have to show you will really help you contextualize this and understand how to actually apply it in real games. Okay, so we have triangulation, and finally we have charting a course. So charting a course, as the name suggests, is a process where you decide where you ultimately want your king to be before you get there, right? So it's like you're plugging in your, your final destination into Google Maps, and you're deciding which freeway to take. But first you wanna decide where you wanna go in the first place. Now, charting a course, is one of the most important things to do in pawn endgames. A lot of players get into a lot of trouble because they sort of indiscriminately assume that the king has to go toward the center. I see this all the time. Now, as you can understand, the center is a very important part of the board. And if you were to make a statistical analysis, 
you'd probably find that more often than not, uh, the king does belong in the center in upon end games. But that's not always the case. The king has to go to where the opposing side's weaknesses are. And it's important to approach this question critically. So here you have a simple example. If you just sort of close your eyes and move toward the center, you're going to miss an opportunity to win the game. Instead, if you properly chart a course, you'll see that black has a major weakness on h5. And this weakness is accessible to the white king. What's the most efficient way of attacking the pawn on h5? Well, it's definitely not going through the center. Right? It's actually going through the side. You go king h2, and this wins the game. Black is not in time uh, to reach the h5 pawn. Black loses h5, and then white's going to pick up f4 as well. Incidentally, this is a simple example of shouldering. Right, Black moves back to f6, and now you start pushing black away using uh, a type of opposition. This is horizontal opposition, uh, which I didn't formally introduce as a concept. But you can see that all of these concepts, they often, more often than not, they come together. Uh, and you should be prepared for each of the examples that I am about to show you to contain more than one concept, right? Because in real life, you often have to use opposition and zugzong and waiting moves all roll together in one pawn endgame. But I'm going to try to tease each concept out to really show you how good endgame players are able to draw on their knowledge of these individual uh, individual themes and concepts to really uh, produce a masterful endgame display. So those are uh, the nine uh, concepts related to king use in pawn endgames that you have to know. Let's run through them very, very quickly. There is regular opposition. There is distant opposition. Why? Well, fast forward to this example. Distant opposition. There is diagonal opposition. There is, um, there is Zugzwang. There is also pawn-assisted opposition, shouldering, Waiting moves, moves with your pawn in order to induce Zugzwang. There's triangulation, another method of achieving Zugzwang. And then there is charting a course with your king. So let's put these concepts to the test. This is the fun part. Buckle your seatbelts, folks, because some of these examples are going to be super simple. Others are going to be really complicated. But I'm really happy with uh, the material that I chose. Uh, some super exciting endgames and you know, I, I think all of these are about to have a lot of instructive value. So let's dig in. First example, probably the simplest one. This does not come from a real game. I just sort of constructed this position. Uh, a good illustration of using simple opposition in the wild to achieve victory. So white's trying to win the game. White is up a pawn. And the first thing that you have to determine in such Examples is whether you can just start pushing your pawn. But if you calculate, okay, g4, king, c5, black's king is unfortunately in the square. Black's king reaches f7 just in time. So unfortunately, we're going to have to use our king. And you would be forgiven for thinking that you have to make a mad dash to the king side in order to block black's king from reaching f7. But this is where a lack of understanding will really hurt you. Because if you use that logic, you're going to play king c4. But king c4 allows black to step into the opposition, king c6. I might say, okay, well, but but I can go king d4, and it's not, black's not going to go king b5, right? Isn't the whole point of opposition to do that? Black's not going to do that, so the opposition doesn't hurt white. Unfortunately, it does. The opposition hurts white because white's king is never going to be able to infiltrate the fifth rank ever. You know, the kings are just going to dance and dance and dance, and they're going to dance ad nauseum. Of course, white's king can move back. And that, you know, definitely doesn't help. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. In this position, I have a waiting move. I can now play g4, and then I can force black to play king of six, and now I'm the one stepping into the opposition. But as hopefully you already know, and I will have a video on um, theoretical pawn games, this is unfortunately a draw because the pawn is on the same file as the king. The, the, the basic rule is that the further along the pawn is, the worse it is for you. Right, this is a draw, and if you're not totally familiar, that's okay. Um, I'd encourage you to set this up on a board and just make sure you understand why this position is drawn. So back we go to the initial position. A uh, student of the endgame who has mastered these nine concepts will know that the winning move is in fact king b4. White is the one who has to step into the opposition. Now after king c6, again, the point is not to infiltrate to the side. You have to chase black's king in opposition all the way to the side of the board where the pawn is at. King d6, king d4, king e6, king e4, king f6, king f4, king g6, one more time. And this is where 
the actual infiltration happens, right? No matter which way Black's King goes, you're going to step the other way. The ultimate goal of this procedure is what I call unrolling the red carpet. King G7, you can do the same thing one more time. Opposition, bang. And look at this. The red carpet has been unrolled. You can start pushing your pawn. You can continue pushing your pawn. After the king goes to G8, again, one more time. Opposition, roll that red carpet out. G6, G7, and you're going to make a queen. But the big takeaway is that opposition um, is a repetitive concept, right? It's not like you step into opposition and that's it. You often have to pursue the opponent's king in a state of opposition until you are actually ready to infiltrate. Okay, now you might say, well, what about long distance opposition? That's a confusing concept. Can you show me an example of that? Absolutely. This is a famous study. This is a uh, invented position. This position was invented by a guy named Neustadl, I think German, in 1890. I'm always impressed when you know, you got these these guys in the 1800s coming up with super instructive endgames that we can still learn from today. So the goal in this position is for white to make a draw. It is white to move and draw. So obviously, pause the video, uh, take some time to see if you can figure out uh, the only way for white to draw. And I'm gonna sip some iced coffee and enjoy myself watching you suffer. By the way, credit where it's due. I saw this uh, position in uh, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, uh, so I would not have known this position otherwise. Okay, so black is up a pawn, right? And, and let's just understand this from a, a general standpoint. What would it mean? How can black win a position like this? Well, in order for black to win, black will have to win the F3 pawn, right? Otherwise, neither of black's pawns is ever going to be able to move forward. And in order for black to win the F3 pawn, black is going to have to sh shoulder or knock white's king out of, you know, these three squares. So you might look at this and say, I get it. We need to get opposition. And we're just going to pursue black's king in opposition. Black will not be able to make progress. Unfortunately, things are not so simple. Watch what happens. Black goes king d2. You go king f2. Black goes king d3. You go king f... Oh, wait a second. There's a pawn on f3, so we can't keep... Pursuing black in opposition, we have to either step back, allowing black to shoulder us with king e3, and at this point you already know the procedure, one, you know, to the right, down, and then whichever way white's king goes, black's king goes the opposite way, king g3, you go king f1, king g1, you take the pawn, right? Familiar concept by now, again, king g2 or king f2, white's king is now finally forced out of its defensive stance, black takes the f pawn, and then promotes the e pawn to a queen. So the f3 pawn actually hurts white and prevents white from continuing to grab opposition. Similarly, if white goes king g3, then again, black is the one who claims opposition and then shoulders white's king off of the f3 pawn. So in order to draw this, you need to demonstrate a little bit more subtlety. And what you actually have to do is you have to grab the long distance opposition with the incredible move king h1. This is the only drawing move, which I think is really, really pretty. Okay, so, so how, does this, how does this move work? Well, the point is that this is long-distance opposition. There's three squares uh, between the two kings. And if black goes king e2, then we step into regular opposition. Now you might say, well, wait, didn't we just see this position? And I said this was a win for black. Well, what we actually saw is this position. We shifted the kings once one file to the left, and this hurts white because there's a pawn in the way of the king. If we shift it back to the right, then what you'll notice, oh, sorry, what you'll notice is that white's king can continue to pursue black's king in opposition. But should the black king step in this direction, you correspondingly have to step back to the right. Because if you don't do that, if you play king f2, well, we've been here already. Black plays king d3. If you play king g2, you allow black to step into opposition and shoulder you. So you go king h2, and you just keep pursuing black's king in long-term opposition. The moment the king steps to the e-file, you step to the corresponding opposition square. That's it. Black can make absolutely zero progress. King e1, king g1, king d2, back to h2. Now, there is one attempt that black can make if we rewind all the way back. After king h1, black can try the move g4. And here, it's very important to resist the temptation to take the pawn. 
Black will promote with check and win the game. Instead, you have the great defensive resource king up to g2. Now, this threatens to take the pawn, and then the pawns will promote simultaneously. But if Black takes the pawn, then White's king is able to uh, reach the e-pawn before uh, it's it's vis-a-vis, -vis and Black White is able to draw the game. So this is a famous study, and the takeaway here is... Uh, again, that regular opposition isn't some sort of panacea, like you automatically grab opposition in any case. You have to actually look at the position on the board. And in this case, a long distance opposition is a more effective defensive tool uh, because of the way that the pawn is placed. Okay. All right. So on we go to uh, our next example. And this is another relatively simple example that illustrates pawn assisted opposition. So what's interesting is, I think this is a game from the under-12 World Youth Chess Championship. The guy playing black, a Turkish uh, Emre Khan, he would later go on to become a GM. He's a very strong grandmaster now, uh, but this game was played back when he was a little kid. So it's white to play. And as per usual, you know, pause the video, uh, see if you can figure out what's going on in this position, who's playing for a win, and, and try to figure out what you would do if you were playing white. All right, so uh, drawing on knowledge from pre our previous videos, you might notice that white is an advantage because black's pawns on the queen side are in a deep freeze. White's single pawn is controlling both of black's pawns. Now you might then say, well, don't we have the same thing in the center where black's two pawns are, are deep freezing white's three pawns? Well, no, they're not, right? White can't play e4 immediately, but white can use his king uh, to help push that pawn along. And indeed the best move is king d3, Black has nothing that he can really do, so he played king e6. And e4 is a classic pawn breakthrough, uh, and black sees nothing better than to trade all of the pawns. Now, what's interesting is that a more resilient defense for black would have been to ignore, would have been to, to make a waiting move such as a6. White is still winning here, but the winning process is pretty complicated. It's a little bit outside the scope of this video. So for now, we're going to limit ourselves to the game continuation. Black trades and trades and gets this position. I think Black's logic here was that White will be unable to push the king away from the sixth rank, and even though White has a pass pawn, he will be unable to make progress. Well, Mr. Khan was wrong. I think it's pronounced Chan. Maybe I'm... Okay, I'm making a... I will not be a linguist. Um, so why was he wrong? Well, the reason has to do with pawn-assisted opposition. White plays the move d5, and even though the kings are technically not themselves in opposition, I would still refer to this position as an example of pawn-assisted opposition. In fact, the, the pawn on b4 is, is fulfilling the role that would be fulfilled uh, with the white king on d4, i.e. it's controlling the square on c5. So the effect of this is the same as if the white king had been on d4, and the effect is that black's king is pushed back. Now, black has waiting moves, but these waiting moves are totally futile because white can just go between d4 and e4 until black has exhausted all of the waiting moves. And so M. Ray decided not to, uh, you know, continue the agony. He goes king e7, king e5, and we repeat d6. Again, pawn assisted opposition. The pawn controls the two squares on the seventh rank, forcing black's king either backward or to the side, which then allows white to infiltrate. Black played g6, and white just waits it out. King d5, h5, h4, very efficient move, freezing black's pawns, and here Khan resigned, because after a6, white makes another waiting move, forces the king back, and now the simplest win is to play king e6, king e8, now very important technique. Make a note of this, even though it's not directly, you know, a... a specified concept in the video. The fastest way to win is actually to stalemate the king. But you're not literally stalemating the king. You're stalemating it in the sense that you're forcing black to now start pushing his pawns. And because of the way the pawns are arranged, whichever pawn black's push, black will push, you will take it and open up a path for another pawn. And this, in turn, will give white the ability to push his own pawn without worrying about stalemate. And white's pawn promotes first, with checkmate because the king is on the eighth rank. You can convince yourself of this in this line, or you can make uh, a rook if you'd like. And the same thing happens on the other side. If black plays a5, of course, in such situations, you have to make sure that your pawn will actually promote first, but here white's pawn does promote first. And so white is able to win the game. But here we can see that 
The only way to actually make progress in this position is to use pawn-assisted opposition uh, in order to push the opposing king all the way back, uh, which then allows, allows you to win in one of several ways. All right. So next we have a, uh, a really curious example. I, I really think a, a good illustration of how dangerous it is to relax uh, in pawn end games. I mean, so many games are lost because the player just thinks, ah, you know, there's two or three pawns left. Everything is clear. You know, they think they've calculated everything and that's precisely when the blunder happens. So in front of us is a very simple position. It's black to move. And in this position, black commits a terrible, terrible mistake. Now, the easiest way to draw the game with black would have been to play the natural move e4. And white would have had nothing better here than to break through with g4. Now, otherwise, white runs the risk of losing, but this is a protected passed pawn. After g4, you have sort of a mass liquidation and whatever. Black can even play g3 and give the pawn away, um, as we've discussed, because the pawn is in front of the king. This is an easy theoretical draw, and black doesn't even, black can go wherever. So this would have drawn the game. But black decided on a slightly cheekier continuation. Black decides to take on f4. And I'm positive that his calculation went as follows. Okay, my opponent has to take with the king. And who would take with a pawn in this situation? And now black has the very nice move, h4, which forces white uh, to get a corner pawn. And as you know, corner pawn is a draw no matter where the kings are, even without the f pawn, even if you added corner pawns on all of these squares. If white plays g4, then h takes g4 is also an easy draw. But the mistake he made is he made an assumption. You can never assume that a move is bad just because it looks unnatural, right? And here black assumed that white is going to recapture with the king. But in fact, white recaptures with the pawn. And this position is winning for white because black's king is going to get inevitably shouldered. And because white has a very important waiting move with his pawn. Now, black also has a waiting move, but unfortunately, black has two tasks to take care of, and he's only got one tempo to do it, so it's one or the other thing. Okay, so white's king wants to get to d5 in order to, to start shouldering black's king. So you might say, okay, let me beat white to the punch, go king e6, king d4, king d6. I've got opposition, but is it a draw? No, it's not. This is where the waiting move comes in handy. White plays h4, putting black in exactly the type of zugzwang we discussed in the definition section, the king has to move back. And at this point, you should know the drill, shoulder, 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 push the king away, win the f5 pawn, and the rest is going to be very easy. So that doesn't work out for black. Well, then you might say, okay, well, let me deprive white of his waiting move. Let me play h4 myself. Well, now the issue is that you don't get to d6 in time, and white is able to reach c5. And once again, the shouldering process begins and white wins the game. So in the actual game, yeah, in the actual game, black played like this, white played h4, and won easily. So, you know, a great illustration of uh, how, how very simple looking positions can be, uh, can actually be very dangerous, uh, and showing, you know, the importance of considering all, uh, all recaptures, all candidate moves, pawn end games operate by completely different rules. You know, from in middle games, you can often make certain assumptions and get away with stuff. In pawn end games, you really, really need to calculate everything uh, using sort of brute force calculation. Okay. So, of course, you know, that, that was a simple example of shouldering. Shouldering can get complicated when, uh, when there are pawns on both sides of the board and when, you know, the shouldering is associated with both kings kind of starting to run around. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at this example, which I really, really like. I think it's super instructive. It is white to move, and you should intuitively be able to determine that because white's king is a lot more active and further advanced, white is the one trying to win the game. So you know the drill. Pause the video. If you really want to be serious about it, try to spend maybe a couple of minutes uh, moving pieces around the board and see if you can figure out the winning method for white. There's actually only one winning move here. Okay, so when you look at this from a, a conceptual standpoint, you should notice a couple of things. You should notice that the kings are in opposition, and it is white to move, which normally means a disadvantage. Does it mean that white is in zugzwang? No. Why? Because you should also have noticed that white is a b-pawn. What does that mean? That means white has waiting moves, so white can make a waiting move and try to put black in zugzwang. So 
If you picked up on uh, the rule I shared previously, when you have waiting moves, normally you want to make uh, as economical of a move as possible. If you have two waiting moves, you shouldn't exhaust both of them at once if you can avoid that. So if you were choosing between B4 and B3 and you were to do no calculation at all, you should still intuit that B3 has a higher chance of success. Now, I'm not advocating for that, but it turns out that B3 is, in fact, the winning move, whereas B4 allows black to draw the game. Well, let's understand why. The reason is that, you know, the second waiting move is going to come in handy. Why plays B3? Now, if black steps to the left side, then it's all very easy. You play king d6, then king e6, and we win all the pawns. That's, you know, that, that, that's simple. The hard part is figuring out what to do after king d7. Because you can say, well, aha, well, now I infiltrate to the left side, but there's nothing on the left side. If there was like a pawn on a7 or something, that would be one thing. But white will not be able to win this game without either winning the c pawn while keeping the b pawn alive or finding some way uh, to get to black's pawns on the king side. So, okay, so what do we do now? Well, there's actually two ways to win the game. And the simplest, the most elegant, is to now make the second waiting move. This is why you had to play b3 rather than b4 at the start. This puts black in Zugzwang. Again, we can see opposition being at the, at the core, at the center of all of these endgames. No pun intended. Black has only one move, stepping back to d7. Now we start to shoulder king b7. Either black loses the pawn or after king d6, you make your way to c8. This is an amazing position. It's Zugzwang. Again, black has a choice. Either you give up the c pawn, the game is over, or you push c5. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that the simplest win, bc actually does win, but b5 wins even faster because white's pawn promotes with check. Remember from the pawn race video, identifying the checking zone. You should have already noticed as soon as black's king was on d6 that a pawn race was likely to be advantageous for white because the pawn would promote with check. So notice the use of of the opposition, Zugzwang, and waiting moves, and of course, shouldering, which is really the, ma the main theme uh, of, this, of this example. Uh, the second win, by the way, is to immediately play king b7, but this gets a lot more complicated after king c5, so you're welcome to figure this out on your own, but, but the, the elegant move, uh, the clinical move, rather, is b4 in this position. And then shouldering, Zugzwang, and again, when you have two waiting moves, you normally want to make only one. If we had made both of them at the same time, you'll play before. And if we get the same position after king d6, this is where you don't have that additional waiting move. And now it is white who is in Zugzwang. White has no choice but to just keep pursuing, you know, the opposition. Uh, by the way, if white plays king a6, great use of long distance opposition. No, do not play king c7 after king a7. It is white who steps into the opposition and wins. Instead, you play king e6, long distance opposition, and keep pursuing white's king, king e8, king e8. The moment white plays king b7, you play king d7, and white doesn't have that extra waiting move. All right, so now we're going to get to um, uh, a couple of more complicated examples. Ooh, let me rewind this. This one I really, really like because it is another just phenomenal illustration of of the importance of, of waiting moves uh, and, and the, the importance of, of understanding how powerful they are, how impactful they are. So we're looking at a position from an old Soviet game, my favorite source of uh, illustrative examples. It is black to move. And once again, because white's king is so much more active, black is the one trying to hold the draw. White is the one trying to win. The big question is where should black move his king? B8 c8, c7, a8, only one square leads to a draw. The others lose. See if you can figure it out. Okay, so much like in uh, the example with, with the three pawns, uh, where black fell into the shouldering trap, here Alinsky does something similar. I think he didn't put too much thought into this move because it, it your hand is reaching for the c7 square. Like, how can you not play king c7? Who would step back to the eighth rank deliberately, right? Well, a good endgame player would because a good endgame player understands that, you know, you can't decide anything on a visual basis in pawn endgames because the rules are different. After king c7, 
black loses in very straightforward fashion. King c5, pursuing black in opposition. And at this point, we infiltrate. If king c7, then king e6, white easily wins the pawn race. And if king e7, white plays king c6. But this is not the end of the story. You might remember also from the pawn race video that um, one of the tips I, I shared is that you should you should always test a defensive strategy that involves pursuing the king. If there's a corner pawn, pursuing the king into the corner and trying to lock the king up with your own king. And black can try to do that here. Black can go king d8. And after king b7, king d7, king takes a7, king c7. And he's got white's king locked in jail. King a8, king c8. But guess what? Guess what? Well, if you have been paying attention, then you would have noticed that white has exactly one waiting move and black has zero. And this waiting move comes in handy. White plays h5, putting black in opposition and in Zugzwang. If king c8, then white goes king b6 and just runs the king to the other side. Uh, black can't hold both at the same time. Or if king c6, correspondingly, king b8 and white promotes to a queen. So this is how black lost the game. Now let's rewind to the initial position. Wouldn't it be great if black could somehow get like this position, but it, it was white to move. If it was white to move here, white would have to exhaust his waiting move already here. And then the strategy of cornering white's king might actually lead to success. Now, how can you engineer that scenario? Well, the only way to engineer it is to play the brilliant defensive move, king b8. I guess I should have flipped the board, but you know we're looking at most of these from white's perspective anyway. So hopefully that's uh, not to distract. Actually, let me let me flip the board here. How does this work? Now, at first, it might seem like this is even worse than king c7 because you're giving white the chance to step into c6. But the theme is the same. It doesn't matter where you're getting opposition. The eighth rank or the seventh rank, the upshot is the same. The upshot is that white cannot infiltrate any further without exhausting his waiting move. I mean, black is holding by a thread, but white's king has no way forward. And if the king steps back, then black keeps pursuing white's king in opposition. So at one point or another, white is going to have to play h5. And now we adopt the lock strategy. We go king d8, king d7, king c7. And this is where white needs that waiting move. White doesn't have it anymore. And black achieves an easy draw. Because if white plays a7, after king c7, it is white who's lucky to make the draw. White has to start giving away all his pawns because the king is stalemated. And ultimately, this leads to stalemate. Uh, so just, I think, an amazing example of, again, you know, refraining from the, the natural move and understanding that sort of fully perceiving the dynamic between the kings is more important than just making the move that's closest to the center. And if you only take like one thing away from this video, the relationship between Zugzwang, opposition, and waiting moves, like those might be the big three uh, in, in pawn endgames, but king b8, such a nice defensive move in order to force white to exhaust his, his last remaining waiting move. Okay, so a couple of further examples uh, to illustrate uh, the remaining themes. And I see this video has been going on for 48 minutes. I'm going to try to keep this to about an hour. I know this is long, but you know I really just want to get through all these examples uh, to, to hammer all these points home. So... Um, Okay, so this is from a Title Tuesday game that I played recently. I had the white pieces against uh, David Paravian. And this is another good illustration of diagonal opposition and of shouldering. So in this situation, my opponent plays what looks like a very nonchalant move. He plays king f5. As it turns out, this move loses the game. Okay, how does it lose the game? As usual, pause the video, see if you can figure it out. Now, one thing that you should notice, of course, is that both sides have a bunch of waiting moves, two to be specific. Both sides have two waiting moves. So the win is yielded by f takes g4, king takes g4, and king e4. Now, of course, my opponent saw this, and his logic was, okay, I'm going to go king g3, my opponent's going to go like king d5, and I'm going to win the pawn race. But black's king is actually getting shouldered. And it's getting shouldered with respect to the queen side. A scenario is ultimately going to unfold after king f5, where black's king is going to be further away from the queen side than white's king is. And at this point, black cannot abandon the f-pawn because 
white reaches the c-pawn and wins so black has to start exhausting his waiting moves and after a6 hopefully by now your hand is automatically reaching for the a3 square a4 actually does end up winning the game as well because here white has a waiting move with his king but the clinical move of course is a3 a5 a4 black is in zugzwang my opponent played f3 and after takes takes king e5 i am able to reach the c-pawn first okay next example we haven't done a triangulation illustration yet and once again in subsequent videos we're going to take a look at more complicated examples of triangulation this is a relatively simple one so it's white to play so white's got a deep freeze going on the king side and white has a pawn majority on the queen side clearly the goal for white is to uh, transform this pawn majority into a win how is white going to break through well you can't play b6 because that simply gives away a pawn and without b6 it looks like white can't make any progress but prince very strong dutch player multiple time dutch champion finds a brilliant idea based on a keen understanding of triangulation rather than playing b6 he gives a6 check looks counterproductive now you're making it even harder for yourself to play b6 but the point of a6 is to create a square on a5 that you're going to try to get your king to but how are you going to do that black plays king c7 and hey if you play king b4 then black is going to go king b6 and all of a sudden white's the one in zugzwang and you got to allow black's king to reach c5 but no 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 white doesn't play king before white triangulates with king c3 this forces black's king off of c7 either you get this same position with black to move enabling white's king to infiltrate a5 or or black has to step away and this allows the immediate win with b6 the simple breakthrough uh, and white uh, promotes the pawn to a queen so in the game black saw nothing better than to play king b6 king b4 king c7 king a5 and if the king steps away white plays b6 as it turns out black has a breakthrough with g5 and this does lead to simultaneous promotion it does lead to simultaneous promotion but it's still a very easy win for white because white is already up a pawn and uh, after another check prince just basically takes the rest of black's pawns this is okay this is a super easy win he takes all of black's pawns with check uh, the queen endgame is a very easy win so it's very simple rudimentary but you can see here triangulation is not as complicated as some people make it out to be you just you know you identify the position you want to get okay if you don't have waiting moves you can walk around the key square with your king trying to get your opponent uh force your opponent's king into a lose-lose decision either you hit the mind square or you step away and allow uh, upon breakthrough for example okay i've got two more examples to show let's talk about charting a course because that's the one concept that i haven't really explicitly talked about in the illustrations just yet so i really like this example because it's it's just such a good illustration of how white could have made uh been a lot more successful if he had explicitly applied this idea of charting the course so in this position it is black to move and black is right now up a pawn but he's losing the pawn on the next move that pawn cannot be defended so Lasak finds an ingenious idea he plays d3 classic deflection right force the king back and black charts a course where does black chart a course too well as i've said normally you want to head for the biggest weakness not just blindly toward the center of the board so black doesn't just go king e6 black says well white's only weakness white's only undefended pawn is h2 and so black starts walking toward h3 and this is where white responds on autopilot white says well black's going to h3 i have to defend that pawn so i'm gonna have to go to g1 but white doesn't actually go through the process of charting a course what if white were to do the same thing that black did where is black's biggest weakness what is black's only vulnerable pawn well if you ask yourself that question you're going to realize that the answer is f7 and so the only drawing method would have been to chart a course directly for the f7 pawn and the drawing move here is king d4 only move now there's a race black goes king g4 white goes king e5 but it's not too hard to calculate this at the end both sides start taking each other's pawns black starts eating first but it doesn't matter because after king takes g3 king takes g6 either you have total liquidation or you have a pawn race resulting in simultaneous promotion and 
Um, if you paid attention to the pawn race video, you would check quickly to make sure that there are no skewers, no, no nothing. There's no funny business. This is a draw. So king d4, it's as simple as that. In the game, white plays king e3, allowing black's king to get to h3. And although white has defended, you know, the biggest weakness, white's king is way too passive and black wins. Okay, f6 isn't even that necessary. But in this position, black plays the very simple move h4, shattering white's pawn chain and forcing white after the trade to lose the f4 pawn. Black is just going to go king g4, king f4. White tries one last trick, the move f5, actually a very ingenious little move. Taking on f5 would be a terrible move, uh, giving you doubled pawns, and white would use the outside passer to make a draw. So, of course, black instead plays g5, and then calmly walks up, takes the pawn, and this position is very easy to convert. So, charting a course, the takeaway is when you have you know, a position like this, you don't just want to blindly head in a random direction with your king. You want to know where you're going before you start, and you want to evaluate the various options. Sometimes you want to chart a course uh, that results in passive defense. Sometimes that's the only way. But you always want to consider an aggressive course as well. What if I counterattack my opponent's weaknesses? And last but not least, we have really the cherry on top. Uh, I could spend a long time on this example, but I'm really going to tease out the most important aspects because we are nearing an hour. Um, and, you know, I know you guys are busy. Uh, so this position occurred. Well, it didn't quite occur. This is a slightly different variation on the game. Uh, this is an, an old game between two pretty strong players. Actually, the guy playing black, Mongolian I am, he was very, he's very well known for playing a for being on the receiving end of a brilliancy against Bobby Fischer. Uh, you should check that game out if you haven't seen it. Just search Fischer Miagmar Soren. Not the easiest name to pronounce. Take a look at that game. You won't be sorry. Uh, but he played other games, and here he is also on the losing side. It is white to move in this position. And again, first thing you do is you hit the main points. Whose king is more active? Who's got the waiting moves? You know, what's going on? Well, obviously, white's king is more active. And it's pretty easy to determine that white has more waiting moves. White's pawn is on h3, which means that black has an extra waiting move on the king side, but white has two waiting moves on the queen side, at least for the time being. Black also might have another waiting move if white's king leaves a5. So it's, it's not totally clear who's got more waiting moves. Both sides have a lot of them. So we need to figure out how to make progress with white, and we need to chart a course. We need to figure out where to go with our king. Well, if you look very carefully, you'll notice the black has a serious weakness on the e5 square. If white can get the king to e5, you will then be able to infiltrate the entire king side. And so we chart a course. We start going there. We play king b4. We're going to d5. But we forgot to understand how opposition factors into all of this. And king b4 is actually a serious mistake that results in a draw. Watch what happens after king b4. Here you allow black's king to get opposition king b6. The kings dance around to d6. And now we get a classic scenario of mutual zugzwang, where both sides will now try to exhaust all of their waiting moves uh, such that it will be the other side to move. If white exhausts his waiting moves first and it's white to move, this will be a draw because the kings will just start dancing. But if white can engineer a situation where it's black to move and black has to move his king, then you know the drill. Either white infiltrates to the right or to the left, and in both cases, white is able to win. And so let's start telling. White has to start making pawn moves. So let's say white plays h4. Black plays g6. White plays g3. Now, once again, you do not want to exhaust two of your waiting moves at once. h5 is a terrible mistake. Because if a3, not a4, a5, a4, and black is in zugzwang. So instead, black draws with h6. a3, a5, a4. And h5, and white's the one in Zugzwang. Now, you can also try a very clever move, h5. You can play h5 yourself, trying to sabotage uh, your opponent's waiting moves. g takes h5, a4. And you can say, hey, I, this worked. Black is in Zugzwang. Unfortunately, this method almost never works because black sacks the pawn back in order to generate that extra waiting move, h4, gh, h5. And again, we have a draw. So... The reason this fails is because black is the one who steps into opposition. And wouldn't it be nice if we got this position 
but it was Black to move. If we could get Black to be the one to start exhausting his waiting moves first, then we would have a chance to induce Zugzwang. How do we do that? The way we do that is we try to spring a trap. We try to force Black to allow White to be the one to step into the opposition. And the way you do that is with the brilliant move King A4. Now, you shouldn't be looking at this move and saying, I don't get it at all. The intention of this move should be very clear. You're trying to lure black into playing king b6. Now white steps into the opposition. We get the same situation with black to move. And I'm going to go through this really fast. Both sides start exhausting their pawn moves. Blah, blah, blah. h6, g3, h5. Now white plays a3. And it is black who is now in Zugzwang. Okay? But obviously black is not going to cooperate. Black is like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not going king b. I'm not letting you get into the opposition. I'm going to go king b7. And now you get this cat and mouse game where both sides are trying to get the other uh, to be the one to flinch. And this is where we turn to long distance opposition. Rather than playing king b4, white plays king b3. Now the kings are in a standoff. There is mind squares all over the sixth rank. The moment either side puts their king on the sixth rank, you step into the opposition and win. So we start doing a little ring around the rosy. King c7, king c3, king d7. And again, it looks like white's not going to be able to make any progress, right? Both kings are just going to dance around the seventh rank. But notice that pawn on a6. That pawn is very close to white's king. And this is where white suddenly takes a sharp turn. Bang! Sharp turn to the left. What's the idea? Well, white's threatening king a5, right? We chart a course. We don't forget about our opponent's biggest weaknesses. Black has to defend that pawn with his king. And there's no way to do that other than king c6. After king d6, king a5, white wins on the spot. And after king c6, what do we do? Well, we go back to c4, and we've gotten our target position. King d6, king d4, and once again, both sides start exhausting their pawn moves, their waiting moves, a5, um, a3. By the way, if black plays a4, uh, then white can just win by approaching the pawn with the king. Black has to start moving on the king side. Let's say h6, h4, you know the drill, h5, g3, g6, and a4 with Zugzwang, king c6, king a5, and it's important, or sorry, king c6, actually the best move is king c4. This is an easier win because now after king d6, king b5, white is able to win the pawn race, and after king b6, king d5, you can actually win this in several different ways. You can shoulder black's king away and win the a pawn, or you can go toward the king side, and the pawn race is going to be won by white because, and this is a scenario that we uh, explored a lot in the pawn race video, white promotes and simultaneously stops black from promoting as well. So, you know, I could have slowed down there, but again, the key takeaway is, is that opposition really stands at the heart of all king use in pawn endgames. It's all about who has the opposition, who benefits from the opposition, and how do you use the opposition uh, to get to where you want to go? So we explored nine concepts, four of which were different types of oppositions. We talked about Zugzwang, and notice how intermingled, intertwined these concepts are. The key takeaway is that you want to always assess how many waiting moves you have. You don't want to exhaust more than one waiting move at a time. You want to know where you're going with your king before you start getting there. And you want to determine how, you know, who is the one that wants to, usually you are the one who wants to step into the opposition. And I hope that these examples, you know, as complicated as some of them are, uh, really helped to contextualize the tools and the concepts that we talked about in the initial section. Uh, that was a whirlwind tour, and we have several more videos to make, but Hopefully, this gives you a better sense of how to use your king in pawn endgames. Once again, we'll talk more about triangulation. We will explore uh, more complicated forms of Zugzwang in the subsequent videos. So we'll have one more uh, sort of instructional conceptual video, and then we'll have one video where we really put everything together and, and start exploring more complicated themes. Well, it's been over an hour. I know that's a lot of time for a YouTube video. I want to thank everybody for the, from the bottom of my heart. If you sat through the entire thing, you know, round of applause to you. Thank you for making the time, and I hope it was worth your while. So now we've covered pawns. We've covered kings. We're moving uh, in a positive direction. There will be more endgame videos coming out soon. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Hope you enjoyed. 
and uh, I'll see you in the next video very soon.